Representative Rudnicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of things. I'd like to um, to refer my colleagues to um, a yellow um, paper that was put on their desk um, that affects their individual school districts that are in, in their districts. Um, and I'll use mine as an example. I have two school districts that I represent. Um, and if you look at that, particularly, there would be in uh, the MS-89 school district, there would be um, 182 students removed from school based on um, this bill. If you look at the Mercer and Smithfield schools, which is RSU 54, the Skowhegan area, and if you look at the whole, um, the whole school, the district as a whole, that's 200 students removed. Um, so in in those two districts, um, MS 8049, uh, 1. 6, well, 1.7 million dollars would be affected um, to that district, and the um, RSU 54, it would be. 2.2 million dollars if we are actually kicking students out of school and segregating them from being able to um, to go to school based on this law so because of those reasons because of civil rights because of the fact that it should be a choice of and parents rights to what they want to put their child through um, I am going to um, I am not going to support this bill Senator Puglia. It just blows my mind that my well-intentioned colleagues on this committee, who all believe in the importance of a public education, we come here every day to support that, are going to willfully say to a significant group of Maine's public education students, we don't want you in school unless you follow these things, which they have a whole multitude of reasons why they're not doing it. These individuals that are not getting vaccinated, maybe some of them don't have the right information. Maybe them, some of them believe in, you know, unicorns and fairy tales. But there's a lot of really well-educated, intelligent parents that are making these decisions that they feel are in the best interest of their children. And to say to them, sorry, we don't want you. I, I just, it flies in the face of what we all sit on this committee and talk about all the time. And I mean, where is the risk? Where is the risk? We've been told by Maine CDC that our numbers hover around 95%. Okay? There's some that say in pockets, yeah, it's around 80 to 85. I think we should spend a massive amount of time going into those districts to educate, you know, in those areas where we have the pockets that could potentially become a problem but, but aren't yet to educate them about, you know, the importance of vaccinating. I support the goals of this bill, but I vehemently disagree with the implementation. For us to say to a whole group of students, we just don't want you anymore, it flies in the face of what we all espouse to believe in on this committee every single day. I just don't understand how anybody could support legislation that's going to segregate a group of students in the state of Maine. I would encourage committee members to um, resist as much as possible attributing to other members a certain motives or intent. Um, Representative Brennan. Just a, a question, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, where, uh, what was the source of this information? I put it on the desk. I forgot to mention it. On my, please. I put those on your uh, desks. Uh, so, so, okay. Uh, because so I was just looking at it, it wasn't attributed to yeah, any I'm particular. Sorry. Person, so thank you. Where? Oh, the hands are flying. Um, Representative Drinkwater. Yep. Thank you for recognizing me for the second time, Madam Chair. You're pushing it. I know. I am. I'll make it brief. I would just like to remind my fellow committee members that yes, we could say, okay, you're not going to be allowed in school, but you're going to see those kids on the ball fields, the soccer fields, and they're all going to mingle. So this, to me, is about civil rights of the religious minority. Thank you. Senator Carson. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chairwoman. There has been a lot of discussion around the horseshoe about our targeting a minority, about somehow our not wanting children to come to school. I strenuously disagree with that perspective. 
getting all of our children vaccinated is about protecting our children, all of them. When you have, when we have information from the US CDC, from children's hospitals, and I spent a long time on the Philadelphia Children's Hospital website looking at the information there about vaccinations. Not just from the Maine Medical Association or the American Academy of Pediatrics, but from family physicians and pediatricians who have come and testified and who provided all the information one could really hope for about the value in 2019 of preventing outbreaks of infectious diseases. It's, it's hard to imagine getting more or better information and what more time would give us. I believe we have done our due diligence. Could we do more? Yes, I suppose we could. Um, would, it, would it yield information that could help us make a more informed or a better decision? I personally doubt it. And in closing, I will, I will say that there's a very small part of my perspective that is colored by my own experience of a granddaughter who was diagnosed with ALL leukemia at age five, had absolutely extraordinary, the best treatment imaginable at the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. And when she came home after her first extended stay, one of the pieces of advice that rings in my ears from her oncologist, affirmed by her pediatrician, because her kindergarten at that time had less than 90% vaccination rates for pertussis and for several other things is don't send her back to school this spring. She got out of the hospital, I think, in late March or early April. She was out of school for two months because we wanted to protect her. Was that a voluntary choice that we made? Absolutely. Was it a choice to protect by, on the part of my daughter and our granddaughter to protect her? Absolutely. People who make decisions to send to refuse vaccinations are making a different kind of choice. In my view, they're making a choice to potentially, I think Dr. Blaisdell, Blaisdell addressed this, to potentially put other kids at risk who are immunocompromised as my granddaughter was. We have to make decisions in 2019 that are for the greater good. And this is one of those. And that's why I will be supporting the bill as amended by the sponsor. Thank you. Representative Dodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, fellow members of this committee. Health, religion, and choice are important to all of us. To those people who oppose this bill, I have heard your concerns. We have heard your concerns with our brains and with our hearts and with our focus on education. But this bill and the amendment deal with a phrase that has already been uttered about the greater good. And as a teacher, I believe it is my responsibility as a legislator to help keep Maine students healthy and safe. I will be supporting this bill and its amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Cornfield, ready for a motion. I move LD 798 ought to pass as amended. Second. Uh, Representative McRae seconds. Any further discussion? Representative Rudnicki. Um, I would like to ask one further question of my colleagues or if there's somebody out there that can um, at, explain to me in some of the testimony that we received, um, there was talk about the fact that there is a lack of liability 
for the VAX industry. And I would love to know um, how we feel that um, if, if an industry is not um, available to take responsibility for something that they are requiring that we put into our children, then what, what are we doing and what are we asking our parents to do if they're not even willing to take, if, if this industry is not willing to take responsibility for, for that? And I would, if somebody has an answer to that for me, I would certainly appreciate it. Okay, so just a point of clarification, the industry is not requiring the vaccines, that's the public policy that it is. But there's a question um, to anyone in the room who would like to answer. A number of years ago there was a severe shortage of vaccines and the manufacturers were pulling out of the market. The federal government set up a vaccine claim no, it's a no-fault claim reimbursement form and said this will cover the liability for it. The manufacturers will not be liable for the effects of the vaccine. And to date the federal vaccine compensation form, and I didn't prepare this, but it, it's in the billions of dollars that is paid out for things that have been assumed to be vaccine injuries. So there is compensation available, but for public policy reasons, in order to have vaccines available, the government had to set this up. I believe it was in the early 1980s. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, did you say billions of dollars have been paid out for people who have been vaccine injured? Yes. Okay, thanks. You sound like the greater good to me. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Shardlow, and I can clarify what Dr. Losey was referring to. Part of the 1986 uh, National Vaccine Injury Compensation um, Act, actual, National Vaccine Injury Act, was it required the United States Department of Health and Human Services, as uh, Representative Tipping has provided in his amendment, a similar provision that required uh, biannual reporting of vaccine safety studies. And to date, in the 30 plus years that have um, been experienced since then, not a single one of those reports has ever been done. Uh, the United States has never done an independent study of vaccine and vaccine safety. Um, and it... Okay, so I'm sorry, the question is about liability, so... Yes, that's part of the, that? that was part of the, the trade-off in that program, was that vaccine manufacturers are completely immune to liability from any vaccine, doctors are as well even if the vaccine is inherently dangerous or defective in its design. In trade for that, there were supposed to be safety studies done, and none of those safety studies have ever been done. There was a recent uh, lawsuit filed for those uh, studies. They don't exist. The United States has never upheld that, that part of the act. And uh, there is also one other sort of issue that hasn't been addressed. If no. I could, no. okay. Um, and are you affiliated with any group? I'm not. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's been a motion and it's been seconded. Any further discussion? Um, so I haven't spoken yet. Uh, I've been listening very carefully, reading <coughs> quite substantially um, the many concerns from both sides of this issue. I'm not going to debate the issues now. I just want to um, commend my colleagues for their diligence, their patience, um, their commitment to this committee and to um, this legislature. Um, I know for me, the amendment that's been proposed addresses some of the concerns, especially with the extended impl uh, implementation process. The expansion of, of medical professionals, the elimination of prescriptive rulemaking, um, and the requirement of reporting. I, I have faith, perhaps more than others, in our main CDC that we will 
and <clears throat> I'm sure there are other members in this committee that will be returning that will make sure um, that that comes back to the legislature. So I plan on supporting the measure. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries. The minority report? Ought not to pass. Thank you, everyone. That concludes the work session on <clears throat> LD798. We have a second bill scheduled for a work session. I'll allow um, the room to clear if that's the plan. <coughs> Yes, we are. Okay, if this room could, um, folks have conversations, please take them out into the lobby, please. We do have a second bill, LD987. Okay, Ms. Netto, would you like to um, walk us through uh, 987? Sure. <clears throat> so, LD 987 is an act to provide autonomy for health care providers to practice patient-centered care by amending the law governing medical exemptions to immunization requirements. So um, the bill provides that a medical exemption from immunization for the purposes of attendance at a nursery school, a child care facility, a family child care provider, or an elementary, secondary, or post-secondary school, or for employees at certain health care facilities is at the sole discretion of the students or employee's health care provider. So section two of the bill, um, you will see, creates a new definition of health care provider. Uh, sections 4, 8, and 10 of the bill um, incorporate what I just described. Uh, section 4 relates to students in public or private elementary uh, or secondary schools. Section 8 relates to students in public or private post-secondary schools. And section 10 of the bill relates to employee or employees at certain health care facilities. Section 11 um, relates to rules for child care uh, facilities licensure, and Section 12 relates to family child care providers licensure. So um, in all of those various sections, the key is that the medical exemption uh, is at the sole discretion of that person's health care provider. Um, Another part of the bill uh, proposes to prohibit the adoption of rules or policies related to medical exemptions, including, but not limited to, rules, rules or policies that establish requirements for medical exemptions, and rules or policies requiring review, acceptance, or rejection of medical exemptions. And again, you will find those in sections 4, 8, and 10 of the uh, bill. And then finally, um, well not finally, uh, the bill also removes the authority of school boards, the governing boards of private schools and municipalities, 
um, to have more stringent immunization requirements than state law. And you can find those provisions in Section 5 and in Section 9 of the bill. Um, sections 1 and 6 relate to certificate of immunization. Uh, the written statement must come from a health care provider or public health official. And Section 3 relates to written assurance that the child will be immunized within 90 days or provides written consent to the child's immunization. Again, the change is either by a public health um, well, public health officer or health care provider is the new element. And finally, uh, Section 7 repeals the definition of school health provider in the uh, provision of law relating to immunization of students um, in a public or private post-secondary school. Thank you very much, Ms. Meadow. The committee. Um, Representative Cornfield, may I have a motion, please? I move LD987 ought not to pass. Representative Farnsworth seconds. Discussion? Senator Puglia. Uh, we had no discussion on the bill. I'd love to know why my colleagues don't support this measure. Senator Pouliot, would you like to share why you support it? Well, I think that we've had a lot of discussion about the importance of the medical profession and uh, supporting that practice and their relationship with their patient. A lot of people talked about that in the last legislation, so why would we not support that with this one? So in my view, this bill um, actually uh, would conflict with the work that we just voted on. Um, and actually the amendment incorporates um, some of what is trying to be um, obtained through this bill. So I believe that the um, ought to pass as amended uh, vote that was just passed in the prior bill addresses the uh, substantial amount of what this one tries to accomplish. Senator? Um, none of my Republican colleagues are here, uh, so I make a motion that we table this bill. Is there a second? There's no second, but I'm happy to have a corner caucus so we can bring folks back in. Okay. Okay, we're back. So there's a motion on the table of ought not to pass. It's been seconded. Um, for those that weren't in the room, um, Senator Pouliot had asked, uh, well, Senator, would you like to, we can. Yeah, um, the, the, the amendment that was presented by uh, Representative Tipping, 
I think is an effort to acknowledge some of the concerns, but there, it's my understanding that that doesn't affect the uh, post-secondary medical exemptions, and so I just have a number of concerns around the fact that there are going to be populations of students who aren't necessarily in the K-12 system. I think we're thinking about this in terms of like protecting our kids, the K-12 population, but what about the post-secondary uh, aspect of it? I don't believe that his amendment speaks to that at all. I disagree, but that's okay. <coughs> Could you show me where it does? We're working 987 in My, the way I read 987 was that it was trying to address the ability of medical um, doctors to be able to um, make determinations within their scope of practice. We heard that in the other hearing. I think that has been incorporated by that amendment. So. Okay, no further discussion? What was the motion, Madam Chair? Uh, the motion was not to pass. Thank you. Yeah. All those in favor? All those opposed? And the minority report is? Uh, to pass. Okay. Okay, so um, we have public hearings at one. Um, committee, I invite you into the chair's office for some mini cupcakes and